Without hope, I wouldn't be here. Okay. Because when I applied to Teachers College, I met Hope, I was the chairman of the department at the time, and I said, I have to tell you something, to tell you the truth. I have to tell you, Hope, that I just flunked an exam at the new school for social research, and Hope said, so what? <laughs> so here you have the history of Hope and my relationship, and then she was my doctoral dissertation advisor wow. in 1970. Now wow. can talk and I just have to add to that that <laughs> I've never known for sure whether the story down. was true. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> but I really like it. <laughs> it's a true story. Okay. Dr. Ruth really does not need an introduction, but I will give you a brief one anyway. Um, Dr. Ruth graduated from TC with her doctorate in 1970. We know who, know who her thesis advisor was. Um, and Dr. Ruth is a psychosexual therapist who, starting in 1980, helped pioneer the field of media psychology with her radio program, Sexually Speaking. Today, sexually speaking, uh, no, see, not today. Sexually speaking was heard across the country via television, books, newspapers, games, home video, and computer software. A former kindergarten teacher, she would go on to study human sexuality with Dr. Helen Singer Kaplan at New York Hospital Cornell University Medical Center, and she is considered a pioneer in spreading what she has now labeled as sexual literacy. I think most of you are educators and you know what a great pleasure it is when your students are successful and do things that you don't expect. And this has been a banner day for me because I also worked with our first speaker this morning, Ellen Lagerman, was on her dissertation committee. And now the greatest surprise of all was Dr. Ruth. When I said, so what? I had no idea she would become Dr. Ruth, but I knew something very important was going to happen. And I, I also just want to add that part of uh, your friend, a colleague, and I've learned, had the interesting experience of following her around and having a view of what it is to be a celebrity. And it's amazing to me that just on the street, anywhere, almost anywhere, people come up and they want to have your signature, they want to say hello, they may want to ask you questions you don't want to answer. That because moment. you are next to me, otherwise I <laughs> <laughs> But uh, you handle it beautifully. <laughs> and and I see some of my students over there, raise your hand. <laughs> and best my of second. all, you have said to me when some of these wonderful moments happen, it's the joy that I like. Isn't it great to be Dr. Ruth? That's cool. <laughs> also, one other thing I think we must mention that one of the things that's really important in your story is that you are a grandmother. We both are, but you are a grandmother and there's a quilt of your grandchildren here. We're okay. going to now... One more sentence. <laughs> <laughs> one more sentence. The reason for the quilt that my daughter Miriam, uh, who has a doctorate from Teachers College... And your son Joel. And my son Joel has a master's, a doctorate from some other institution. <laughs> so the reason, on a, on a serious note, uh, my daughter Mia made that for me for the last uh, Mother's Day and chose my four grandchildren. Usually, as you see, my um, daughter is not here, my grandchildren are not here. I usually keep my professional life, because I talk so much about sex, very separate <laughs> for my family, but for you educators, uh, because I have such respect for you, that you are not going to Wall Street, that you don't do any of those. You hear, Tom, I have a lot of respect, because you are really giving your life to a wonderful profession of educators. For you, I did bring this, because the point I'm making with this, which you will see in the movie in a moment, is Hitler and the Nazis did not win, and uh, people like myself won because we survived. We'll talk about that in a little while. I have to say that it's a great privilege to see this film. It is a BBC film, and we're very fortunate to see it, and Eric Brown has done a wonderful job of excerpting it. It's even hard to speak after it. It's, mm -hmm. it's such a combination of being moving and inspiring and depressing and uplifting all at the same time. I was fortunate enough to see the entire film 
at one of your birthday parties, and my youngest son was there, and my late husband had a similar, although not quite as difficult experience, but I, after seeing the film, uh, my son and I walked all the way from the Battery up to Midtown Manhattan, <clears throat> talked almost all night about the implications of this. And I think for me there's another point that we often see people who are celebrities, and particularly in topics that are uh, engaging and uh, without thinking about the backstory, without thinking about the other sides of the person's life, and I think there's an important issue in that. So to me, it's, uh, it's moving yet again to see this accepted version of the film, and we're very fortunate. And I would like to ask you a, a, a few questions about it, and I will ask a few questions. We'll have a conversation, and then we will turn to the audience and give you some time, because I know one of the main things you're here for is to uh, have a chance to ask questions yourself. But um, there, there are several, th there are any number of things that strike me, but one, one question I do have is, what, what was most surprising to you in the film? Then I want to ask you a question about your about childhood. But um, I, I was I myself the the film it's called Extraordinary Women. There is a, a film. It's twelve uh, twelve women. Twelve women. One is Andira Gandhi, uh, Grace Kelly, other women, and it's a British film, uh, a BBC film. And when I saw it the first time. Uh, I, I taped it, I taped one part here, one part as you saw in London, one part in, in, in Israel. Um, what, what really uh, made me very serious and, and sad, there are pictures here about Nazi Germany that I had never seen. Because as you all know, Great Britain went into World War II um, in 1939. In September, the Americans only went in 41. So there are pictures here about Hitler and about uh, the Nazis that I had never seen. And I was glad about that because one of the reasons that I'm uh, so pleased with this film, as sad as it is, mm -hmm. is that it's the answer to those people who are deniers of the Holocaust. People who say that never happened, it's a fragment of uh, Jewish imagination and uh, um, there are more and more people who uh, write books about that and as you can imagine, I'm going to be 85, there are going to be less and less witnesses. Mm -hmm. So for me, the feeling of here is a piece of film uh, that will um, that will show people this is not a Hollywood film. This is a film, a documentary. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the reasons that I'm very pleased. On a personal level, it's um, a wonderful uh, testimony to what all of you are engaged in in terms of education and to show the early socialization, the very early childhood experiences that have kept uh, people like myself being able to function. I did my master's thesis on the uh, children who were with me and I followed them. I did, I did a longitudinal study and with a questionnaire and with interviews and uh, that was my master's thesis at the New School for Social Research in Sociology. Uh, that's not what I flunked. I flunked another <laughs> course when I went on for my doctorate. And thank God I came to teach at college because it, this is really where I did belong and where I belong. So, uh, but it was interesting to see. Uh, it wasn't difficult for me to find uh, the 50 children who, were, who came out of Nazi Germany, became orphans, and most of them went to them Palestine, some to the United States, a few to Canada, um, some stayed in Switzerland. One of them went back because she was um, convinced she was a communist and she wanted to rebuild Germany. Mm -hmm. But all of them reinforced that knowledge that all of you know, because you are educators, you are in this field, that how important it is the early childhood, how important it was for me so that I can still today 
uh, uh, live on that, on that, on that love, on that attitude about um, uh, studying, on that early childhood. So that was an, a very important point for me, the one about the early childhood, the one about uh, the denials of the uh, Holocaust, and to see how important education is. That's what it's all about, and how important family is. Can I just go a little further on the issue of the early childhood? Because you, you make it very clear in the film, and I've heard you do this uh, elsewhere, just in personal conversation, but you make a, a strong point that you had a happy childhood. And I know my, my husband did the same thing, and I think it's, it's quite I, remarkable. I, I read her husband's book, and I knew him. <laughs> right, and it's to me quite remarkable um, that given all the things that went wrong, you were able to remember a happy childhood. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could say a little more about remembering a happy childhood so that's under why, these circumstances. Yeah, that's why all of you who are involved in, in Head Start, uh, my daughter Mirja, who got a doctorate here, is the uh, head of a program called, um, in, in Hebrew it's Edgar, and uh, it's, it's before Head Start, it's a family, a based program teaching mothers to be teachers of their children before they go to Head Start. And uh, Hippie, it's called Home Instruction Program for Parents of Preschool Youngsters. So uh, th this is such an important part of people, what they can carry with them. It's not only the attitude about uh, studying because that nobody can take away from you, but it's also what you are asking about the emotional part. This grandmother of mine mm -hmm. had nothing else to do in life but to take care of me. She was a widow and my, father, my mother helped my father in the business and she was a very, um, she was a, an observant Jew. Uh, I can criticize some things today uh, which we could discuss at another time. Why did they not try to leave? But that's a different issue mm. in, 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 in terms of raising what happened to German, uh, uh, German Jews because they believed in learning and they believed in uh, Goethe and Schiller and all of the people, all of the uh, intellectuals of Germany and they believed in Germany. I do remember my grandmother writing, she will not go any further than to the cemetery. She did not. She was not a Zionist. I became an ardent Zionist in the orphanage. And um, most of us became very uh, involved in saying to We have to do more studies about that, mm. and we have to do also uh, one of the studies that you are interested in, that's why I'm wearing a music pin, because I did a book about musically speaking, not just sexually speaking, <laughs> musically speaking, a life through song, because the songs of my childhood, part of that what I'm talking about, that socialization, I do remember when I read uh, Henry's book, he remembers the songs the same ones, but these were Viennese. The, the Frankfurt Jews didn't have anything to do with the Viennese Jews. <laughs> That's a different topic. That's a different topic. That's a different topic. But there's no question here. I mean, I read any of those uh, diaries or any of those uh, background stories. It it does say what people take with you. All of you could write the same book by saying. What was the music in your life? What was that uh, importance of songs that were sang to you by grandmother, by aunts, or whoever, whoever it is? This is a topic in which we hope to do some further work together because of my interest in family memories and the various ways in which memories have passed on or modified them. So we have a common interest. I have to say something about Carrie. I met last night, I was a judge on, a, on, a, on, a, on cheese sandwiches. Why, why I was a judge? I did somebody a favor. I'm really not.
not interested in nutrition. However, it's food I went, and you see how short I am, so maybe I did not eat enough when I was smaller. But I did go, and I already brought home the phone number, giving it to Carrie on Monday, of a chef who is interested in nutrition and memory. So that's, that's one of the things that all of you are in education. Uh, when you hear something like that, to right away take the opportunity and uh, do something with it. Carrie Russo is an administrator and researcher in the Elgin Wood Center, and she's working on a project on nutrition and narratives and memories. And, and she finds and the, the classroom that I have to teach on Mondays. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask that, uh, turn to another topic that's, say, that's part of the same discussion. Um, I think one of the amazing things in your life story and this way that it's portrayed so well in the film is that you reinvented yourself. It's a story of resilience and courage and an amazing power to overcome. But it also is an example of reinventing yourself, not just drawing on the strengths of the early childhood, but continuing to do that through various stages of your life. And I'm wondering, how do you see the, the issues of reinventing yourself? So the first, the first uh, response that pops up in my mind is that I'm so Jewish that I have a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> who, knows, who knows what chutzpah means? Nerve. And for me to be able to talk about things that the, that the uh, Victorian Puritan mother uh, would say to her daughter, uh, lie back, uh, don't expect anything at the night after the wedding ceremony, lie back and think of England. So for me, <laughs> Again, in the Jewish tradition, in the Talmud, it says, a lesson taught with humor is a lesson of a taint. I could never tell you a joke. I hear jokes, and most of them I don't even get. <laughs> and I go in one ear and out the other. But I can hear a situation, and I can use humor. And you all in education, that's what you are doing. So uh, part of that, when I uh, say, how did it happen has to do with having the nerve to do something that I believed in and uh, being uh, using humor. And it's very interesting because I just did a book about uh, caregivers for Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with sex. There's very little about sex. But it has to do with my training of paraprofessionals, which I did at Planned Parenthood. And it has something to do, some of my friends have spouses with Alzheimer's. So I said, I have to use, and that's the answer to your question, I have to use that uh, experience that I've had training professionals in, in Harlem for Planned Parenthood to now talk about what caregivers of Alzheimer's, uh, that's the family or the professional caregivers, what they have to do for themselves. What do they have to do not to get depressed? What do they have to do not to get sad because it's such a terrible situation? And it came out of my having a few acquaintances who were in this horrible situation. I said, I have to do something about it. I'm very fortunate I can talk well. I'm not computer literate, but I have somebody, Pierre Leho, with whom I've now done 18 books. I talk. He writes, I get it in pages. I say, no, I don't want to say it this way, or it doesn't belong here. Here, that same book, hold it up. I'm not selling the book, I'm just showing it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I want to make another point here. When you say resilient, or how I'm changing, in this book, Teacher's Cottage Press, about the danger, I let you hold it up. Oh, well, I will <laughs> gladly hold it up. I'm not advertising it either. Just but I have to tell you something. I want to show educators like you how somebody like myself can change my mind. I used to say for young people, I mean for parents, never to pry into the diaries of their young uh, children or the grandchildren. That's private, not to pry. I changed my mind. I said, today, every parent, every educator like you, 
has to be aware what the young people do on the internet because young people think that they can retrieve it, gossip, or naked pictures, and you all are aware. So that's another thing where I, the, the resilience, where I took an opportunity of the background that I had to uh, say to Teachers College Press, let Pierre and me do a book um, about the danger of the internet. We have to take some questions. Yeah, let me just ask one more question or make one point, and then we definitely want to take questions from the floor. Um, I think you have not only been admirable, and, and the humor is so important in making this possible, in changing from a very dire situation and reinventing yourself and continuing with new careers, but you got, in a, another sense, when you become a celebrity, particularly with a topic like sex, it's hard to move into other topics, and I think you're doing something particularly impressive in moving into developing uh, film and documentaries and teaching on media, where you've had a lot of experience. So I say you're in the process of another reinvention. Would you agree? Yes. Who wants to give us money for the project on music and memory? <laughs> <laughs> who knows somebody who wants to give us money? Somebody say I a promise good sex for the rest of their lives. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's take you, you, can, you can always say a friend of mine has a, has a question. You are the one. <laughs> Sign up so I can hear you. Hi. Hi, I'm Samantha. Thank you for talking. Um, uh, just a quick question. Did you ever have any moments of self-doubt and how did you overcome those moments or moments where you didn't feel supported? How did you um, find uh, comfort or that strength um, when so, you felt a little... So, of course, I had self-doubt. In the diaries, I had doubts that I would ever marry, so then I got married three times. <laughs> <laughs> But I certainly thought, as you heard, that I, I thought I was short and ugly, and I had the same doubts that any teenager has, has had. Um, I do have a good, a good sense of uh, saying, OK, I'm sad right now, but let me go on from here without dwelling on it. I also, when I did the first autobiography, all of you, uh, they are my student psychologists over there, uh, uh, when I did my first, uh, the uh, uh, All in a Lifetime, it's called, and uh, I went to a therapist. I went to somebody who came from about the same background, very experienced uh, therapist, and I said, I'm doing this book. I need to talk to somebody uh, in order to sort out my uh, thoughts and uh, things. So I knew when to get help. I think that's the most important answer to you, that if somebody does become uh, uh, overwhelmed with whatever it is, grief or upsetness or whatever happens in life, uh, to know when to go for help. I also knew when to say, when I went, after a while, when the book was already published, when I went to the therapist and I had to walk, on the way walking there, all of you have had that experience, I said, what am I going to talk about today? Then I stopped because I'm not going to pay somebody <laughs> to say, what am I going to talk, talk about today? But I did go for help. And, and I think, yes. You are two and you are, you are yeah, number three. You are number three. Go. Hi, I'm Amelia. Thank you also. I was wondering, you spoke at the end a little bit about the internet now. And if you were doing your show um, now, when in the age of social media, what are some of the things you might say in talking to people about um, interactions around? I'm just wondering what might you say in an age now where there's social media, whereas it wasn't there when you were speaking to people about sex on your radio show in the past. She um, does tweet. I, I, have to, I have go on my tweet. Ask Dr. Two. What, what, what do I have? Third. Seventy-six thousand three hundred and six. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I have to tell, I have to tell you. Um, for example, some of my concerns about AIDS have not changed. The contrary, young people think they don't have to worry about it anymore because they don't see any AIDS patients. So I talk about that. 
The other thing on Hope's question, I'm doing a brand new television on a cable, it's called Shalom TV. But what I'm doing is just like editorial. So I take 10 minutes and just talk about some of the things that are of concern to me right now. Sex and relationship, and for example, uh, what I'm very concerned about, which you all have uh, knowledge about, I'm concerned that young people are um, holding hands and each one is texting somebody else. <laughs> and we are, going, we are going to lose the art of conversation. Yeah. And for you, that's why it's so important to sit around like what we are doing. I see only one guy having his phone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so in my classroom, nobody has a computer in front of them. So we have a lot of things that you people have, have to worry about and talk about. Yes. You. Um, I'm Becky. Yes, Becky. And I saw you 30 years ago when I was doing my undergrad. Yeah. Now I finished my doctorate. Congratulations. Sex was in my mind at that time because I was an undergrad. I should hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm 85 and it's on my mind. <laughs> so I, think, I think you have another book to write. Because you know sex is just among of many things in this world and life. And mm -hmm. you know, I now travel many years and it's that whole idea of happiness and community and you know, love that it's not all about sex. So can you expand on that? And maybe write another I, I book? Said, I, I'd say I, I probably will do another book, but, not a, but there's no question. I talk excellent. Uh, let me first tell you what has changed over the years. That's important for you educators. Uh, what has changed? The problems have not changed. That's the answer to you, Becky. People are still lonely. People still have trouble finding somebody of all ages. And so the problems have not changed. He comes home, I'm pointing at you, but it's not you. <laughs> he comes home and he finds his wife in bed with, an, with, oh. with, with his best friend. Oh. All of the problems have not changed. What has changed is the vocabulary. And what has not changed in all of my 450 television programs, I never did reality shows. I used actors and actresses. They got paid for portraying, we assigned them problems. My producer, John Lolos, whom you met, assigned them problems. I didn't know the problem. They came to my office as if I'm doing therapy. When the segment was over, I could tell them, you did that very well, wonderful actor and actresses. They got paid and I could sleep at night. I would never do a reality uh, show. But what I do, to answer your question, I talk a lot about relationships and I talk a lot about the difficulty in today's world about relationships and about finding somebody. But in the Jewish tradition, it says that when you are born, there is somebody uh, born who is going to be your partner. Now, uh, homosexuality is a different issue in terms of the Jewish uh, tradition, but I have always had the same attitude when a homosexual couple walks into my office, two men, two women, and I just went to that panel on, on diversity. I always have the same, uh, I, I, I treat them with the same respect that I would treat anybody else. But we have to know, and you have to know, that we still do not know the etiology. That means the reason for. We also don't know the reason for heterosexuality. We just need more research. Masters and Johnson and, and Kinsey, it's a long, it's 50 years ago. We need today new studies, which in today's climate, because of money, is difficult. We don't know yet where they come from, but we need new studies. So the one thing about reinventing my ears, uh, uh, maybe because I'm only four foot seven, <laughs> I'm very much to the ground to hear what are the concerns. <laughs> Maybe more than somebody like this guy there, tall, six feet tall. But you also listen to tall people. <laughs> so, um, oh, yeah, we are over time. Okay, one more, please. Yeah, I'm so happy what you said about remembering the childhood, really. Because I know a number of my peers 
from Germany and Austria, they don't want to know about it. They are rejecting it. But I feel if I would reject it, I wouldn't be whole because this is part of me. And especially music, because Henry Leichter, my very good friend. They were friends, friends since early and childhood. I, yeah. We always were singing the songs. Of the childhood? Hours. And yeah. it made, and that's the answer to you who asked about sadness or being upset about something. If, yeah, you put into your head the songs that you heard growing up. And we were the happier for it, for singing those songs. And you can still sing them, I know. <laughs> yes. It gets in. Okay, okay I, one more. I, one more. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, I want to know, there's an expression that says you live your life forward, but you understand it backwards. Do you have any, uh, as you understand it backwards, any sense of transcendent forces choosing some of your decisions? No, but I have two German programs that I give you. <laughs> one is... Dear God, give me patience immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other one is, uh, to answer your question, the other one is, look forward. Does not mean that you forget the past. Look, I brought you this just to make that strong point of not forgetting the past, but to look forward and to, and to rejoice in, in, in what we have today. I understand that we're over time. It's a great anguish to end this, but I want to thank Fran Riemer, and I want to thank you. <laughs>